Winter is here. The crazy weeks of the rut are gone and the wide eight is in my freezer. After five months of dedication to this land, it feels like every corner of this property is connected to some memory or lesson. Luckily, there's still one more chance this year to capitalize on everything I've learned. Joining me for the final hunt of the season is Meat Eaters Conservation Director Ryan Callahan and his good friend Anna Borgman, a first-time hunter who grew up in a small town in Oregon. Anna is part of a program called the Good Meat Project, where she teaches butchering classes and promotes an honest approach to eating meat. Learning to hunt is just another way for Anna to explore where her food comes from, and I can't think of a better mentor than Cal. The back 40 will be a perfect place to teach Anna the ropes. But first, we've got to get her sighted in with her muzzleloader and learn a little bit more about why she made the trip out to Michigan. So what kind of experience did you have growing up? I knew you grew up in Oregon. Were you around hunting? Was that anything your friends or family did? Friends did it. My family never did. We lived in this tiny little community in Central Oregon, but it was, you know, like show and tell growing up. Everyone brought in whatever they'd killed that weekend. But I didn't, I didn't understand what it was about. I didn't, I didn't really think about it that hard. Now, I mean, through thinking about where I'm getting my food and how I'm interacting with the food system and with the place that I live. I mean, we talk about eating, <laughs> eating local. It's like there's really no more eating local than, than taking an animal off the land where it, where it lives. I haven't known anyone else that really is into hunting. You know, I mean, it's like, even living in Oregon, I ended up living in, in a city, so no one was hunting around there. I know I came from a family that had like a bunch of freezer burned steaks, because just like nobody quite knew what to do with it. We were hunting, but it was like, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and so it kind of like took a leap that way. So I'm excited to see your kind of journey here as you start from like being more formally into food. Yes. And then coming into hunting. In, in that progression. All right, you ready to shoot a little bit? Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Get you oriented. Cool. The opening of Michigan's general firearm season has come and gone, but now the December muzzleloader season is upon us. This is a great chance for Anna to learn to hunt with something a little more traditional. Hey, what do you think about this? Uh, I've got the Midwestern lead sled. It's a bag of soybean seeds. That's, that's how we do it out here in Michigan. <laughs> and just squeezing all the way through and just follow through. Am I seeing it just a little to the right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's beautiful. Good, good job. You want to talk about shot placement? Sure. The old roadkill button lock. Love it. You know, obviously a bigger deer, you're going to have a bigger crease here because you have a bigger shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, but when you bring those crosshairs up, you have a horizon line on the back, you know, nice straight line. Um, you got a big white patch underneath here. Um, and then you have the crease of the shoulder, all good things to orient your shot with. Um, and then I just find this, right? Cause this is a big chunk of meat. And I bring it back four or five inches and you're going to be in front of the diaphragm. Okay. And right square in the lungs. It's a lot to take in. It is, but I've been thinking about it for a long time. I'm excited. Yeah. I mean, this, that's really how I got to this point anyway, was through thinking about food and how I want to take control of where I get my food and kind of removing myself from this system that we've built that isn't working very well. And yeah, taking responsibility for And having that direct connection, connection to the land. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we're trying to do? Yeah. So should we go see the land? Do you want to actually see the back 40? Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> I've never seen it either. No. No. Right. Yeah. No. I guess, yeah. Steve's been out there, Yanni's been out there, but you haven't. So. Exactly. Best for last. Yeah. Anna and Kale have a couple days to hunt, and really any deer will do. I'm going to head out for a few final sits with my bow, too, and I'm starting in the back corner of the property where Ben O'Brien had his close call during the rut. It's going to be nice to just sit and enjoy this place 
while hoping that Anna can take home some venison. So, what I think we should do, if you guys look clear across the valley, you can see that little green strip up there on the other hill. Mm -hmm. That is the back side of the back 40. And we've got some oats and some other forage planted on that hillside and the next one down. There's a ground blind situated in that middle field. It's field number five is what we've creatively called it. And it's adjacent to this ridge system where a lot of deer are bedded. I've been getting trail camera pictures in from our past hunts of seeing does come out of that bedding area feeding to those fields. I think if we just slip down here, cut across the swamp and get to that hillside, put you guys in that ground blind, that's the best chance, I think, to see some deer. Grab this thing. You're like, you want to um, be like, with the intent of following through, right? Like you're driving that shot to where it needs to go. Um, I mean, you're letting it do that much of the work, but you are actively keeping it on target. It is an odd thing, you know? Like, I know you're a skier and spend a lot of time in the mountains and stuff like that. Um, probably used to a larger landscape, but like, especially like if you want to talk about like, like just like active food procurement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Provided if you have to fly to Michigan, right? But if this was your backyard. You just come out here and get it. It's a deer garden, right? That's awesome. That'd be really nice. Yeah. I just love this time of the season. You kind of, you kind of, know that what's done is done and the season's slipping away and rather than feeling pressure I usually just feel a sense of content maybe earlier this year here in the back 40 you just worry and you sometimes lose sight of just the moment that's happening right now but in the late season I can just breathe out take in the surroundings and just enjoy what is happening right in front of you without expectation. Is your anticipation level at it? It's not pretty hard. Okay, yeah, you're not feeling like you've been duped yet. Okay, good. I mean, I do feel like, like typically at this time of year, when they're really like aiming for feed, they like should have been out here by now. So you should probably like just kind of quietly wrap all your gear up and sneak on out of here. Day one, no deer. It wasn't quite the experience I was hoping to share. We've got one more chance, or we'll be left with another disappointing hunt and a consolation roadkill deer to butcher.
example of the timing, right? It's like those does were bedded, you know, 110 yards from where we set up. They just did it before we got set up. Yeah. So. I'm disappointed. Anna came all this way for so little action. The back 40 has been stingy once again, but we're not going to let this phase us. There's still some wild meat to be had. I can't, I can't claim this deer really for myself, but I did run across this deer on the side of the road the other day. Yeah, you harvested the deer. <laughs> Salvaged or something. Uh, yes. And I thought it would be good to have because I know that so much of what you do these days, Anna, is show folks how to process their own meat, how to, you know, how to break down an animal. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking to you about how to hunt. Maybe it'd be interesting for you to walk us through how you would go about the final process. Sure. Um, so I wish this was a deer you shot, but <laughs> roadkill will have to do for now. <laughs> this is even kind of different for me because I've never broken down a deer from, you know, like this. I'm never the one skinning it. I'm just the one teaching the butchery aspect right. of it once it's, it's on the table, so. We taught you how to skin and how to hunt. <laughs> now you can teach yeah. us what you do. <laughs> Could you better explain what exactly you do with the Good Meat Project? So the Good Meat Project was started by um, a woman, a butcher, Camus Davis, who lives in Portland. And she was really interested in teaching people how to butcher. She had learned and it kind of changed her whole relationship to food. Um, so it is a nonprofit that teaches whole animal butcher, butchery and slaughter to chefs and farmers. Um, and now we work to start meat collectives in cities around the country. So it's kind of starting similar things in, in these little satellite locations. So there, I think there's maybe five or six right now. We go and teach people how to start these collectives so that they can then teach people in their community how, how to butcher. So that people can either process their own stuff or someone's there to process it. You don't have to ship it off you know, hundreds of miles. Some people are driving 12 hours a day to reach a processor wow. with their animals. And it makes it really hard to then put your money into the farming instead of just into. Right. And I imagine equipment too. Maybe people are sharing equipment. Yep, absolutely. Or walking coolers or things like that. Yep. And that was the impetus for the Good Meat Project is that when Camus started it, she had been in France and she saw how these people work together, um, sharing tools, sharing equipment, sharing spaces, and it was just, it made it so much easier for everyone, and everyone was getting better meat, yep. the animals were being treated better, the land was better, I mean, we just don't, we, not many people have that, uh, that opportunity here, right. so, yeah. So do you want to pretend like we're a couple of your students then? Sure, and I could explain. I would be really interested in, like, just, just pretend like we aren't who we are, we're students, <laughs> Okay. and you've got a lamb hanging here. I to have my way of doing things, yeah. right? Yeah. Which means I have a lot to learn. So. <laughs> Front shoulder is something that, in my experience anyway, like most people are like, I don't, it seems like there's a lot of blue skin and seems pretty sinewy and it just ends up in the grind pile 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, do you do anything uh, fun with that? Uh, with the shoulder, I like to, because it just comes off in one smooth piece and it's a little bone, it's easy to bone out. And so you take this humerus out, get it off the shoulder blade, and then you can roll it up and have a really nice little roast. A lot of this is kind of like filling a fish sometimes where you're just trying to get yeah. super close. So, 
This is a little shredded because he's a little guy and he's got a lot of connective tissue in there. But with a bigger animal, you'd have a bigger sort of slab there. And you basically, you can take it from either side, roll it up. You don't want to get some of that silver skin off. You can tie it, you can leave it like that. You could vacuum seal it like that. And you've got a little boned out shoulder rest. And you're utilizing basically the whole shoulder. Yeah, exactly. My biggest takeaway from all of this is how much you can do with so many different pieces. And if it's easier to grind it, I totally get that. But if you have the time and the inclination and you want to learn how to cut it up a little differently, eat something a little different, you, you can. It's worth a shot. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully you came out of this experience feeling like you took away something too. Oh, I couldn't be more appreciative of you having us out here. I mean, this is like the beginning of my story now. Yeah. So, yeah, I can't thank yeah. you enough. This has been incredible. It's fun. Well, you've got a little more work to do out there too, so. Yes. Hit the road. <laughs> she never ends. Anna's getting on a plane to head back west, but Cal and I have one final chore to attend to before calling it a season. The plan is to cut and split some firewood to heat my house through the winter. Thankfully, one of the simpler tasks we've had on the back 40 this year. So what do you think about the place? Man, I like it. I, I know, or like that whole ecosystem health that I, I think is really cool. And then I just start like breaking all this stuff down, like picking up wood is one thing, but it's like, you know, like dead standing timber. It's like, are you gonna pick pick something dead standing? Cause that's like perfect for a lot of birds to nest in. Right. And every single decision out here is fraught with the same issues. Yeah. Do you do this or this? Because that will impact this other thing. Yeah. Nothing exists on its own. Everything impacts and the it's whole like, like thing. a beautiful world if you want to live in ignorance, right? right. It's like, well, my <laughs> actions have no impact. Yeah. But it's just not the case, because if you really start thinking about it, it's like, okay, if I'm taking this thing out, this is what it could be doing. So is it yeah. better served heating my home? It's been a whole lot of, of those types of questions and, and pseudo epiphanies <laughs> throughout this whole thing for me is just seeing both the impact we have but then the, the exact opposite, which is sometimes how little impact we can have despite us trying. Like who's, who's really in control sometimes? I think I've been humbled. Yeah. I've been humbled by the back 40 that sometimes we go into it thinking we can do X and mother nature says, eh, no, that's not, it's not gonna happen. Well, yeah, I mean, no, no shortage of work with uh, trying to plant that little bit of oats, right? Exactly. And man, no offense to you, but that's a pitiful looking <laughs> plot of oats. The plots did not come in well. Right? It's like... Hey, that was a lot of work. It really was. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we didn't get a whole lot of payoff for that. Yeah, and you're but... like, reward me. Uh -huh. Look at what I just did. This has definitely been an exercise in humility. <laughs> As we're sitting here, I was just reminded of this line in the Sand County Almanac, which I keep coming back to over and over again throughout this project. I'm gonna misquote it, but he said something along the lines of there's two great dangers of not owning a farm. One's thinking that your heat comes from a furnace. The second thing is that your food comes from a store. When you're out here and you see this, getting your heat from the land, filling my freezer from the land, it really comes to life yeah, absolutely. on a project like this. That's, you become so much more connected to those things that you depend on when you have a connection to the place it came from. The Back 40 has given me more than just a freezer full of meat and some firewood. It's given me a new perspective. I've come to depend on this land and my connection to it. Now. I'm leaving for the last time this year, just like I did after our first day of work in August. Tired, sweaty, 
and knowing there's a lot more work left to be done. Next season on Back 40, more birds, bees, land prep, screw-ups, a little hunting, and Mark will try to capitalize on all the lessons learned. And we give the whole damn thing away. If you enjoy what you just saw, like this video, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel to make sure you catch all of our future episodes.